Located in sunny Brisbane in southeast Queensland, Australia, QIMR Birkhofer is a world leading medical research institute with 75 years of prestigious history and many significant scientific achievements. Since the 1940s, thousands of scientists, students and support staff work here in the areas of cancer, mental health, chronic disorders and infectious diseases. In the Infectious Diseases Program, we aim to develop drugs, vaccines, and prevention and education strategies against diseases caused by parasites, bacteria, and viruses. My group focuses specifically on understanding the biology of the scabies parasite and on developing new diagnostics and treatments for scabies. To find out more, come see us in the laboratory. Welcome to our short overview of scabies disease and of the research we are doing to change this persistent and global health problem. I'm Katja and I'm a molecular parasitologist researching scabies mite biology for the past 20 years. I lead a group of scientists who have one passion in common, to reduce the burden that this parasite causes worldwide. Why do we do this? Because scabies is a truly neglected infectious disease and really not enough research has been done to understand the parasite and to come up with solutions to the problems it causes. Before I get into this further, let's first meet the team. Hi, I'm Gangi. I'm a trained veterinarian from Sri Lanka. Currently, I'm a second year PhD student with the scabies team. Hi, I'm Sarah. I'm a research assistant in the scabies lab. I have a background in biomedical science and previous to this I trained as a microbiology scientist in a pathology lab. Hi, I'm Jasmine Summers. I'm a Bachelor of Medical Science student uh, doing a six-week placement in the Scabies lab. Hi, I'm Nirupama. I have completed my bachelor's and master's degrees in Sri Lanka. I'm a first-year PhD student at this time. Hi, my name is Tian Lu. I support the group with molecular techniques and data analysis skills. Hi, I'm Deepani. I'm a trained veterinarian and I did my PhD in molecular biology of scabies. I worked as a university lecturer for some time and have recently returned to Kiwama work offer as a full-time scientist. Now this disease has been with humans since their beginning and of course everywhere on the globe. Worldwide, scabies causes substantial harm and considerable public health burden. Especially in tropical climate, scabies promotes secondary bacterial skin infections, leading to further and potentially much more serious disease. Principally, all populations are susceptible, no matter what gender, age, race or skin color. People with immature or poor immune systems, like young children, old people or immunocompromised people, are more frequently affected by scabies. Because the disease is very contagious, overcrowded populations and those with suboptimal health care, which are mainly poor populations, have the highest scabies burden. So this is where we are. There is no vaccine, no easy to use diagnostic tools and very limited treatment options. In 2017, the WHO finally classified scabies as a neglected infectious disease. And it is a truly neglected global problem. Our team at the Kiwama Bokofer Medical Research Institute is one of very few teams worldwide working out the pathobiology of this disease. A parasite is a creature that lives on or in another organism. Parasites live at the expense of their hosts and often cause disease in these hosts. In the case of scabies, the parasitic scabies mite lives inside the skin of its human host, causes intense itching, makes life unbearable, leads to secondary infections with bacteria, and these can cause severe disease. So when you catch scabies, these tiny microscopic parasitic mites called Sarcoptes scabii set up shop in outer layers of your skin. Here they reside throughout their entire lifetime. 
They cannot live long outside the host because they are susceptible to drying out. We call this an obligate parasitic lifestyle. Our skin does not react kindly to this invasion. As these mites burrow along inside the skin, the infestation leads to relentless itching, scratching and often to an angry rash. In most cases, the immune system keeps this infestation in check and the majority of patients present with a low parasite burden, with less than 20 mites on their body and with single lesions, mostly on hands and wrists. But if the infestation gets worse, crusted scabies can develop, which is characterized by a massive proliferation of mites in skin crusts. This condition is rare and develops in individuals whose immune system is somehow weakened. Here you see a scabies mite burrowing through the dense surface layers of the skin. As she burrows down into the fluid and nutrient-rich lower layers of the epidermis, she creates tunnels in which she lays one to two eggs every day for about one to two months. From these eggs, new generations of larvae hatch and these sustain the infestation. The mite releases many different molecules within its feces into the tunnels within the skin. These molecules modulate the environment in the burrow to protect the mite from the host defense. Some of them cause itching and inflammation. The itch makes the patient scratch and this opens up the door for any bacteria that happen to be on the surface of the skin. Because the mite prevents the local immune system from functioning properly, these bacteria can propagate in the burrows and from there invade other parts of the body. Group A Streptococcus and Staphylococcus aureus are the most recognized pathogens associated with scabies, and these are capable of causing serious further disease such as sepsis, kidney disease, and rheumatic fever and heart disease. It is likely that other species of bacteria can invade the skin during a scabies infestation. Clearly, more research is needed. As molecular parasitologists, we work out the interactions between the parasitic mites, the host, and the bacteria. We are looking on DNA, RNA, and protein levels to understand what is going on during an infestation. We want to follow the biochemical pathways and the mechanisms that enable these parasites to survive, to proliferate, and to interfere with the health of their host. Research on scabies parasites is challenging because the entire life cycle of the scabies parasite takes place inside the host. The female mite lays her eggs into the epidermis. From the eggs, the larvae hatch. These develop into nymphs and then into adults, which mate and produce more offspring. All of this requires the moist and nutritious skin environment. The mites cannot survive outside the skin very long. Because it is very difficult to mimic the skin in a test tube, we have no laboratory mite culture, meaning we rely entirely on sampling from patients. Another problem, these parasites are very small. How small, you may ask? Well, if you compare them to an Australian 10 cent coin, and you know the mite is there, you may just be able to see them with your bare eyes. With only a few hundred cells per mite, we need a large number of parasites for a lot of the research that we are doing. However, as you have heard earlier, most patients carry only very few parasites. Therefore, for some of the research, we need to wait for samples from the relative rare but extreme form of disease we call crusted scabies. And a small sample from the skin sheddings from a patient with this condition yields thousands and thousands of mites, a jackpot for molecular scabies research. Medical research should be led by necessity, and therefore three related scabies issues dictate what research we aim to do. One, scabies is not easy to recognize in the clinic. 
We need reliable diagnostic tools that allow medical workers and doctors to easily distinguish scabies from many other skin conditions that cause itching. So this is important because if you treat non-scabies skin disease with anti-scabies medication, you will achieve nothing but aggravation of that condition. And vice versa, if you treat scabies patients with an unsuited treatment, for example, if you use a steroid cream to leave, relieve the itch, then the infestation will take off, it will thrive in the patient and possible close contacts of that patient will also become infected. So, it is really essential that we come up with an easy and reliable test for scabies. Second, we have no vaccine and only very few treatments. And these treatments do not kill all life stages of this parasite. Therefore, our team is focusing on the development of new drugs for treating scabies. And third, scabies can cause secondary infections with dangerous bacteria. These are actually the real threat of the scabies disease, and they can cause serious, long-term, life-threatening health issues, such as heart and kidney disease. However, the relationship between the mites and the bacteria is neither recognized nor understood, and therefore we are researching the microbes that come with the mites. There are no molecular diagnostic tools to detect scabies. However, many skin diseases have extreme itching as a main symptom, and therefore the scabies disease is often not recognized by the doctor, and it is misdiagnosed as something else. Obviously, if the wrong treatment is given, the patient is not cured. Because scabies is so contagious, this also increases the chances of spreading the disease. How can we stop this from happening? We want to develop a simple and reliable scabies test so the doctor can do the test quickly and know for sure whether they are dealing with scabies. For a good test, we need to detect a mite protein that is specific and highly abundant in the infected skin. We have noticed from histology that one of the most abundant mite products in the skin are their feces. Therefore, we focus on molecules that might excrete into the skin and we think some of them could be diagnostic targets. When we analyzed the content of the mite excretion, we found thousands of protein molecules from the sample. So now we're trying to study them extensively so we can understand what are their overall characteristics and which of these molecules actually contribute to the unique signature of scabies infection. Bearing in mind that although we are able to detect all these molecules with great accuracy in the lab, the method we can use at the moment is highly sophisticated and very expensive. So our aim here is to design a diagnostic test that is simple and rapid, but at the same time it has to be highly accurate for it to be used in a clinical setting. You have heard earlier that there is no vaccine available for scabies also, only a handful of treatment options are available to treat scabies. And none of the most commonly used drugs kill the scabies eggs. Why it is important to kill the eggs? Well, a female might lays many of eggs during an infestation. And if you treat a patient only once with a drug that doesn't affect the eggs, the eggs at the time of treatment survive and hatch to a new generation of larvae and the infestation continues, means scabies doesn't get cured. Therefore, when using existing scabies drugs, we need two or more repeat treatments for the proper elimination of the parasite. But the problem is patients often do not repeat their treatments. Another problem is that the continuous use of same existing drug over and over eventually will cause mites developing resistance. So, there are many good reasons why we are looking for novel treatment options. We want to develop a treatment that kills all stages of the parasite so that single treatment is sufficient to cure scabies. So, how do we go about finding a new scabies drug? One important task to do is to search the literature and to make a list of drugs that have worked against other parasites, against worms, insects, 
ticks and bacteria. Among them, there are single compound synthetic drugs and also natural plant derived products some of which have been used in many cultures from the early historical ages for various diseases. Plant-derived products usually contain hundreds of different chemical compounds. We collaborate with medicinal chemists to analyze them and to find the chemicals in these oils that harm the scabies parasite. Once we have identified a potential candidate drug, we test it first in the laboratory doing a procedure called bioassay. We pick lots of mites from infected skin pieces into a petri dish, actually into a small drop of medium containing the drug. At the same time, we pick the same number of parasites into a drop of medium containing no drug. That's a control group. Then we time how long it takes for the parasite to die in the drug assay compared to the no drug control assay where they survive. This takes a lot of patience. You have to observe very regularly until they are all dead. Some drugs kill in less than 10 minutes and some take hours. Using the same assay, we can also test eggs. Again, we expose them to drug in a drop of medium and have no drug control group. For egg assays, we need to wait five days until all eggs have hatched in the control group and less so no eggs have hatched in the drug group. By performing these assays, we can work out the best working doses and optimize exposure times for new drug candidates. So, we collect thousands of eggs or mites and treat these all at once with the drug candidate and then we isolate their DNA, RNA and proteins. These preparations are complicated laboratory work that takes too long to explain here, but I can tell you it is fun to do. When we have isolated RNA and protein, we send these preparations off to specialty lab where they can get analyzed. Our colleagues, they are experts in RNA sequencing and proteome analysis, and together with bioinformaticians, they come back with the results. We then compare the molecular makeup of treated and untreated parasites and often this will give us a clue for the drug target inside the parasite. We will then confirm the targets with more experiments. We can, for example, make the proteins in a test tube and then test the function of this mite protein in the presence of the drug. Once we understand how the drug works on its target protein, we can maybe try to optimize it. And we will also need to test if they are safe to use as drugs. This can be done in cell cultures or in animals. And finally, we will have to validate the efficacy of our drug candidates in real life, which means we have to treat the animals and then human patients in clinical trials. When all this is done, we can hopefully propose a new treatment for scabies. Until then, it's a long road ahead and a lot of research to be done. Stay in touch. The skin is the largest organ of the human body and the first line of defense against invading pathogens. The skin is also a densely populated organ with billions of bacteria, virus, fungi, and small arthropods living on it. Similar to our planet being home to millions of different organisms, our skin is like a landscape providing home to a large biodiversity. We call this our healthy skin microbiota. To help protect our skin, we maintain this diverse community of microbes on our body surface because many of these are useful as they fight off foreign invaders to protect their own microenvironment. Some species of bacteria, for example, release fungicides that specifically inhibit the growth of fungi in yeast on the skin. A healthy skin microbiota is composed of numerous beneficial bacteria that work hand in hand with our own immune system. We have co-evolved with them over a long time and a dysregulation of this system called dysbiosis can lead to extreme skin conditions that can have serious downstream consequences. During the scabies infestation, the microbiota changes. The mite opens up the skin and brings bacteria along. The intense itching causes the patient to scratch and then leads to mechanical damage of the skin. 
Instead of a nice variety of harmless and useful skin bacteria, dangerous pathogens can multiply on and in our skin. They can invade into the deeper levels of the skin where they are not meant to be. They can thrive here in this new environment because the mite has already subdued the host defense system and the danger is that these bacteria can cause more extreme infections. So in really bad cases, they can then go on to invade the bloodstream, which can then also cause damage to other organs in the body. Our research is aiming to discover how the presence of scabies mites transforms the natural microbiota of the healthy skin, which bad pathogens come up during infection and whether this happens in the same way in different populations. For example, a cool climate compared to a tropical climate or an urban climate compared to a rural climate. We also want to find out how well the good bacteria can recover after the scabies infestation has been cleared by scabies medication. It's also important for us to know whether we need to be treating these bacterial infections at the same time as we're treating the scabies infestation. So how do we research the scabies associated microbiota? Well, we sample hundreds of people worldwide using a technique that's similar to the current diagnostic method. We take a non-invasive skin scraping from each patient. However, instead of looking at it under a microscope to look for the presence of a mite, we analyze the entire sample for its molecular content. So from every volunteer, we take samples from scabies lesions and from a comparable scabies free site. We then extract the DNA of all microbial organisms present in the sample to identify the microbiome. We then identify by bioinformatics what bacteria are present in each sample. We can then compare the healthy and the diseased microbiota to each other, and we can also compare this between patients. We can also then go on to compare how the microbiome differs after treatment with a scabicide. This research will open up completely new avenues to understand the scabies infestation and the microbial infections that come with it. Scabies is a truly neglected but substantial and ongoing health problem in remote Aboriginal communities. We believe that ultimately the most effective initiatives to control this problem in these communities will come from the affected people themselves. Therefore, we are working with people in communities, with patients, health workers, and with schools to learn from them what is needed and relay to them what we found through research. Because scabies is common in Australian Aboriginal communities, we conducted science workshops in remote Northwest Queensland, about 2,000 kilometers away from Brisbane. This work was funded by the Lawitia Institute by the Australian Society for Parasitology and by Kiwama Berkhofer. So, we packed up our gear and we went on a long road trip through the outback. We had a lot of fun doing that. We did a series of workshops at remote schools, mostly for grade 10 to 12 students. We gave lectures and we turned the classrooms into makeshift laboratories where the students were able to perform hands-on experiments. We covered microscopy, basic microbiology, and basic molecular biology. We had group discussions about health and careers in health and science, and we had a lot of fun. And later on in the year, selected students came for a one-week laboratory work experience at Kiwama Berkhofer. In doing this outreach, we hope to raise local awareness about skin health. It is also a great opportunity for us to connect with the remote communities, to promote health education and to advertise among the young people for career pathways in health and science. Our recent travels to indigenous communities in North Queensland highlighted an important question. How do you go about eliminating scabies mites from clothes, bed linen, pillows and other textiles, and day-to-day -day personal belongings? This led us to produce an important set of experimental data. We teamed up with Orange Sky Australia, which is a Brisbane-based non-profit organization providing access to washing machines and showers for people in need. They collaborated with us to determine the conditions that eliminate mites in laundry. 
We tested 5,500 mice and 2,300 eggs in 89 different washing and drying conditions. We did this in vitro in the laboratory and also under real life conditions using washing machines and other equipments. Well, this is what we found. Heat kills the best. If you have a washing machine with hot water access, wash the contaminated items at a minimum of 50 degrees Celsius for at least 10 minutes. If you have a dryer, you can run them through a hot cycle instead. Freezing is another option. If you don't have a washing machine, but you have a freezer, you can freeze the contaminated item at negative 10 degrees Celsius for five hours. If you have no white goods and no electricity, you can put your belongings in a plastic bag and wait. Well, scabies might like warm and humid. So depending on your local climate, you need to wait between two to eight days before you can be sure that they are dead. Then you can safely use your belongings again. So I hope we have answered some of your questions regarding scabies and we do appreciate your interest. We hope you can see that a lot of work goes into solving this problem. One of the first steps of solving this problem is raising awareness for this disease. Thank you very much for watching.